Yeah, well, I mean, you, you just uh, said the most important parts, you know, that our bodies, so when we stop eating, um, our bodies are, are constantly looking for glucose. Glucose is the body's preferred fuel. That's what we run on. Um, you know, we think of that as blood sugar. And we have to have glucose in the bloodstream all the time. It needs to be within a particular range or we don't do very well. And so the body's looking for sugar. When we stop eating, um, what the first thing it does is it, well, it continues to use whatever's in the digestive tract for the first eight to 12 hours. Uh, at which point, whatever's there ceases to become very useful to us, uh, given you know the this, this state in which it's broken down or has begun to ferment or whatever it might be. And so uh, at that point, the body goes to the liver where we store glycogen. And glycogen is a glucose precursor. This, this is simply how we store glucose. And we store it in the muscles and we store it in the liver. We, we wind up conserving muscle glycogen for very good reasons. And I can give you an example. Um, Polar bears don't hibernate as most, uh, as many other bears do. But when the females are pregnant, they will build themselves a den and go down into this den and they will be there for five months where they birth their cubs and feed them until they're strong enough to make a long hike. And they'll be there for five months consuming no food or water. Um, they're fasting the whole time while feeding these two cubs. When they're done, when, they, when it's time to come out, on average, they've got to hike about 75 miles, which is, what, 110 or 115 kilometers, I think, something like that, uh, in, in order to get food. Okay, so imagine if they had nothing to power their muscles up, you know, the, the, the mama after five months of being in there. So that we, we retain muscle glycogen because it makes sense to do that in nature or we may have to go climb a tree to get food or whatever it is. But the body takes all the liver glycogen and converts it to glucose. And that's typically an eight to 12 hour supply. And in fact, it's important to point out, you know, some of what I'm about to say is gonna sound kind of strange to many people. And I've been called an idiot at least once a day on, on uh, YouTube uh, by somebody. Um, but we actually measure you know, people's body composition, we measure their muscle mass and body fat. And what the body does, once it's depleted liver glycogen, because two things I think are true that people may not realize. One, you may have decided you're not going to eat for 21 or 26 or 30 or 42 days, whatever it is, but your body doesn't know that. Your body only knows that it's been 23 hours and there's been no food coming in and now it had needs something, right? So it's got to decide what makes the most sense. It doesn't know that it's going to be weeks before there's food. It, it only knows that this has never before happened in your life. You've never had to go this long without finding some food. You'll probably find food any moment. And so because the body's set up to run on sugar, it keeps doing that. But there's no sugar. So what does the body do? Well, it actually converts muscle to sugar. And this process is called gluconeogenesis, new sugar production. Um, it's, a, it's a chemical conversion process. Uh, there's no sugar in muscle, but the body converts it and is able to make sugar to feed itself. Uh, it'll only go, for most people, it'll only go about two more days. So by the time we're three or three and a half days into the process, the average person's body says, okay, you know what? I don't want to burn muscle indefinitely. I don't want to lose all my muscle. I need muscle. So maybe we should start switching over to fat, right? Fat is, I mean, we, we store fat so that we can survive in the absence of food, but we don't go to it right away. And again, we can see this very clearly because we, we actually measure these things every day now. In fact, I think when you were here, we were measuring once a week and I started, I decided, you know, we, we actually have extra personnel here now. So we can, because this takes a lot of time to measure everyone, but we, we weigh people every single day so we can actually see what's going on day to day. And it's, it's pretty fascinating to watch um, virtually everyone continues consuming muscle and how much drops uh, the greatest amount is the first three days. And then the next seven days after that, and by the time we're about 10 or 11 days in, we have gone to a very low maintenance level of muscle uh, consumption. And be, and that's only because even though we're now pretty much fully in ketosis, which means we're running on ketones, which are a metabolic breakdown product from metabolizing fat, right? We store fat so we can survive. Our bodies are now running on fat, but the brain, uh, the sex organs, the gonads, and you know, the whole reproductive system and the spleen are all 
organs and systems that require sugar. And it's, it's, there's not much sugar available from fat. We can, we can uh, make a little bit of, of uh, sugar from fat, but it's much easier for the body to use muscle. And so we do see people's muscle continue to go down. Um, it's not something anyone needs to worry about. Um, first of all, you know, if we look and see, oh my gosh, someone's lost 10 kilos of muscle. Well, muscle um, for the average person is around 68, 70% water. I believe it should be 80, but it's around 68, 70% water. So if we lose 10 kilos of muscle, we've actually lost about 3.2 kilos of muscle and about 6.8 kilos of water that it was holding. And when we rebuild muscle, the water comes back. It's like losing a dry sponge. You know, a wet sponge. We're like, oh, I lost a pound of sponge. No, you lost maybe, you know, you lost, uh, let's, let's talk kilograms because that's your audience. Um, now, let's say you lose uh, 500, you know, 450 grams of a wet sponge. Well, it's really maybe 50 grams of sponge and 400 grams of water. And if you find the 50 grams of sponge again, a dry sponge, it's going to absorb the water with no problem. Um, most people find that when they complete a long enough fast, say 21 days or longer, what I call a therapeutic fast, if it's done properly, the body is so efficient that they re rebuild muscle easily. And in, in fact, this is a bit of an aside, but I just about two weeks ago, as you know, I do a Friday morning, um, 9 a.m. Costa Rica time, live broadcast in English every week now for years, four or five years. And there was a guy who had just left us about three weeks earlier. I think he's uh, about 34. He was a professional football player. Um, that's American football, but in Canada, in the Canadian Football League. And he was injured and had to stop playing. And it, I mean, football had been his life. This is something he'd been preparing for since he was a kid. And, you know, began playing when he was 10 or 11 years old. Um, he was playing professional ball. He got depressed when he had to stop playing because of this injury. Became hooked on antidepressants. And, you know, life became a, a disaster. He wasn't working. He couldn't work. He gained a bunch of weight. You know, he felt like a, a, a bloated, you know, whatever. And he finally came here. And he fasted, I think, for 23 or 24 days and did the refeeding process. And it was about three weeks after the end of his process. He's back home and he comes onto the live and says, I did some deadlifts yesterday and I'm stronger than I've ever been in my life. This is a professional athlete. Three weeks later, after the process, he's living on fruit and salad still is. He's actually coming down this week to volunteer. And he's, uh, he's on his way here now. Um, but, you know, he's still living on fruit and salad. He weighs less than he ever has, I mean, as a professional athlete. And he's eating a fraction of what the number of calories he used to eat. But he's lifting more than he's ever lifted before. And this is what happens. I mean, people are amazed at how strong they can be and how quickly they rebuild muscle after the process. So, but this is what happens. We do consume muscle. And by the time we're 10 or 11 days in, it's almost exclusively fat with a tiny amount of muscle. Um, now, one of the things that's going on, a, a term, uh, thanks to intermittent fasting, um, you know, fasting itself has become much better known, uh, probably easier for people to hear about than it used to be. And one of the things people have probably heard of is autophagy. Um, uh, phagy, that, this comes from Greek. Autophagy literally means self-eat. And autophagy is where the body is consuming the stuff it doesn't want um, to get rid of it and to actually gain energy. It uses whatever it's able to use. And so the body goes in and consumes tumors. It consumes uh, fibroids. It consumes any mass that doesn't belong, any garbage that doesn't belong. You know, it gets rid of what it can and uses whatever it's able to. And it's interesting. I have a client who recently, and again, this, I know this sounds crazy to people, but she fasted 72 days with me. And... Um, she kept a doctor's appointment. She fasted, did this remotely, but she, uh, via Skype, she kept a doctor's appointment that she had scheduled on the 21st day. It had been scheduled before she, we set this up and um, she decided it was going to be much more difficult for various reasons. I won't go into to change it. So she kept this appointment. Uh, just a few things about her. This is a woman who is around 40. Uh, seven years ago, she had, uh, breast cancer and had a tumor surgically removed from her breast and then underwent you know, chemotherapy and all that garbage. Um, she, so here she is, she's 40 years old. 
uh, five years after the medical procedure for cancer, she develops three tumors in the same breast. And this is, uh, by the way, this is all too common. And it, you know, it gives me a chance to come back and talk about medicine for just a second. I mentioned earlier that medicine is about suppressing symptoms. So cancer treatment involves removing the tumor in some cases and treating it with chemotherapy or radiation. And what people, you know, people think, well, the tumor's gone, medicine thinks. I mean, they say, okay, you're, you're cancer free, you're healthy, you can go do whatever you want, right? Um, they don't say, you might want to think about what you're eating and what you're doing. They don't say that. Again, why would they? That would um, eliminate the, you know, the, the customer retention program they've so carefully set up. So what happened, you know, medicine says that cancer treatment is successful if you survive, just live five years. I don't know about you, but the older I get, the shorter five years is. And telling, you know, telling me I'm going to survive five years, yeah, that's not really such a huge prize. Um, and, you know, five years later, cancer comes back. And we see this all the time. And I've, I've literally, I've worked with uh, more than 50 women with breast cancer over the years. And most of them are women who are dealing with a recurrence of cancer, having been told they were perfectly healthy and having the cancer show up again. And this is her kid situation. She developed three tumors. They were growing quickly. This is often the case. It's more aggressive second time around. And she was told that um, she needed to have this treated right away. But, you know, she understood that after the first time around, she had found my videos and been watching me for several years and just waiting for the right time. And so she decided she wasn't going to do conventional treatment because conventional treatment only suppresses the symptom, which is the tumor. It eliminates the symptom. The actual cause of cancer is toxicity and poor immune function. And cancer treatment creates more toxicity and even worse immune function. And so cancer always comes back. And again, brilliant. It's a brilliant strategy um, to you know, keep customers. So here it's back. These tumor in, in the breast, one of the things that's interesting is you can palpate the tumor. You can feel it. You know, if a tumor is in the, in the liver, the pancreas, or anywhere inside the body, you can't really do that. But every time she would see her doctor, the doctor would check to see the size of these three tumors. But it was incredibly painful for excruciatingly painful when the doctor would do this. So on the 21st day of her fast, she goes to see the doctor and the doctor can not find any of these tumors. They've disappeared in 21 days fasting. That's what happens. That's autophagy at work. Okay. That's what happens. Now it's not just tumors, but we see this all the time with tumors. Uh, she also, by the way, since I mentioned her, she had a severely low vitamin D level and she was um, fasting in Boston in the winter time and wasn't even going outside. There's no sunshine anyway. Um, if you don't know, Boston is pretty far north in the US. It gets really cold there, uh, usually starting in October and it again, starts getting warm again in like June. And this is in December. There's no sun, she's not going outside. She's got no vitamin D exposure. Um, she's taking nothing except uh, clean water. And the doctor does a test and her vitamin D is now perfect. It's a healthy range. Um, she also was pre-diabetic with blood sugar. That was historically, you know, 130, 120 to 150 every day. And her blood sugar was now perfect. Um, this is a typical thing. Wow. Um, what's, going, what, what's, what's going on there with the vitamin D? How, does that, how is that even possible? Well, we see this uh, actually, Alex, with all kinds of things, not just vitamin D. I mean, first of all, let's talk about vitamin D for just a second because it's so poorly understood. You know, people think, well, you have to eat animal products to get vitamin D, or you have to eat fortified foods to get vitamin D. And I mean, many people live in places where they're going to have a problem. Uh, this may well be true in Southern Australia, um, as, as it is, you know, certainly for people living in the north of the U.S., anywhere in Canada, um, in much of Europe, you know, if you look at Scandinavia, where you have the greatest concentration of people living so far from the equator, you see that we have the highest rates of depression, suicide, alcoholism, you know, um, and suicide. And this is because we're tropical animals that must have sunlight, you know, ideally every day. I mean, you know, it's, it, we, can, we can store sunlight for some period of time, but, um, and here in the tropics, we might 
you know, for instance, in Costa Rica in October and parts of November, which is hurricane season in the Caribbean. I mean, we're a tiny country here, so from the Caribbean coast to the Pacific coast is only uh, it's 200 miles or so. It's uh, 300 kilometers. Uh, it's not very far. And if there are hurricanes in the Caribbean, we'll have tropical storms here. We might have three or four days, you know, a couple times a year, we'll have three or four days where there's no sunshine at all. But it's never more than, you know, it's never more than five days. In the 16 years I've lived here, I, I don't think we've ever gone more than five days without sunshine. Um, usually, most of the year, there's sunshine every single day. And so it's pretty easy to get enough vitamin D living in this climate, you know, if you set your life up properly. Um, vitamin D is actually not a vitamin at all. It's a hormone, and it's produced by the body. So animal products contain vitamin D because animals make it just like we do. They make it upon exposure to sunlight. That's what we're intended to do. You know, the fact is, again, we can use these other sources, but we're creating problems for ourselves. And what we really need is to get natural exposure to sunlight. You guys did something brilliant this year, and I'm really proud of you for doing it. Um, you moved from Melbourne up to Northern Australia, where you can have sunlight all year long. Hallelujah. And that's what you need. That's what you need to be as healthy as possible. Um, so then, in which case... Um I didn't answer your question, did I? No, 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 I, <laughs> no I'm glad you said that because I was about to get on the bandwagon about in Melbourne. I, I just sound like a broken record saying to everyone, like, human beings are not designed for this climate. <laughs> no, no, exactly. I mean, you know, we're smart enough to be able to adapt to living anywhere. There, you know, there are people who spend six months a year living at the South Pole, you know, doing research there, living. But uh, clearly, this is not what we're intended to be. And it's amazing. I don't know about you. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're feeling it. You've been up there now for what? Uh, yeah, like six months or more, four months. Yeah, I mean, what a difference, huh? You know, I, I personally, I, I was doing pretty well. I spent 14 years outside of Washington D.C., 100% raw vegan, eating organic food, exercising. We, and Washington D.C. is a pretty sunny place. So almost every day, I'd have lunch sitting on a big deck that faced southwest. And, and there was a little corner where there was no breeze. And I would sit out there in just a pair of shorts and flip-flops, even when it was below zero in the wintertime, because the sun would warm me up. Um, you know, it was perfectly fine. And yet I moved down to South Central America and I'm going, holy crap. I mean, I thought I was doing pretty well before. I feel so much better in this climate. Yeah, 100%. You know, it comes down to, for me, like how high is health as a priority? And for me, exactly. it's the number one priority. And for a lot of our listeners, it's their number one priority. And so, you know. As it should be, I believe. Yeah. As yeah. it should be. Yeah. And people ask me why why I moved to Queensland. Oh, is it because of the weather? And it's like, yes, that's exactly why. <laughs> because there's more sunshine here. In Melbourne, we get uh, sunshine during the summertime. Uh, but in the winter, you have to seek it in the wintertime. Like, yeah. Yeah, and, and if you don't, exactly. you, you miss out. You know, uh, up here, um, I I don't have to seek it; I just get it. <laughs> it just happens. Yeah, I mean, you, that, that's right. I mean, it's it's. Um, I do uh, like to spend you know five or ten minutes sitting in the sun every day if I can, but I don't really need to. I mean, normally, you know, I'll, I'll um, as you know, we have extensive uh, trails and gardens here. Um, we're growing again. We, we as, as I think you know, uh, back in March a year ago, we acquired the 27 acres, 11 hectares next door. So we went from a four hectare site to a 15 hectare site. And I've done all, I've done all the gardens and trail designs as well as building designs myself. And so I'm usually outside at least not this year so much because I've been so busy, but you know, all these other years we've been on this site now for eight years uh, next month and eight or nine, I don't remember actually, but, um, you know, I'm usually outside at least an hour a day, which means I, I can't avoid getting plenty of sunshine. You know, my gardeners, the, the guys that work here all day, every day, wear shirts and sometimes the extra, they have short sleeve shirts, but they wear these sleeves to protect their arms because they're out. they wear hats because they're outside all the time. When I go outside, if I only have an hour, I take my shirt off. Right. I make sure that I'm getting more sun because I'm not outside all day like they are. I wish I, I wish I was. <laughs> yeah. Who's, who's got the better job, right? 
Yeah. And I just want to add as well, you know, it's, um, it's not, it's not that I understand. It's not the easiest thing for everyone to just like get up and shift. No, of course, country, of course. You know, um, but like I was saying, for me, my health's the number one priority, and so I did what I had to do to make that happen. You know. Yeah, me too. It wasn't the easiest thing for me either. I mean, I had, you know, Tanglewood existed in the U.S. We had a big building, a big property. We had a lot of stuff. You know, it was making the move. It was a lot easier to stay where we were than to make a move. Right. Right. But, you know, there's, there's nothing like being able to walk outside and pick fruit off our own trees. And as you probably know, we now have more than 150 varieties of fruit growing on site. Um, we, we pick fruit every day. That's uh, it's a beautiful thing. Um, coming back to the vitamin D then. So how did, how did her vitamin D levels actually improve? Right. That, well, we see the her, same. Is it a, an efficiency going on in the body that's being improved or something? That's probably part. I mean, honestly, you know, the, the, the real answer is we don't know, but there's a couple things to understand. Um, our nutrient needs are dramatically diminished while fasting. Now, she, you know, she's, she's well past the faster vitamin D levels. She's still in Boston. It's still winter and her vitamin D levels are still fine. Now, so one of the things that's true is that um, when our bodies are clean and working well, they're much more efficient. The other thing that appears to be true, and this is not just with vitamin D, but this is with all kinds of things, is that we store things in the body and but don't have, aren't able to use them properly. So we see people that come in with uh, magnesium deficiencies or iron deficiencies that will resolve them. And this isn't always what happens, but we see many people who resolve deficiencies while consuming only water where these things aren't present. You know, it seems crazy, but it happens over and over again. Um, So clearly the stuff was in the body, right? I mean, and and again, a big part probably does have something to do with being much more efficient afterward. Um, What are the typical symptoms people are experiencing during fasting? Well, they range from um, cold symptoms and flu symptoms and headaches and nausea and stomach aches. Um, I mean, not that everyone has all those symptoms, but these are all things that can occur and are fairly typical. Um, they, they, you know, it could be anything. The average person is going to feel a bit weak and tired, but may not have much more than that going on most of the time. And uh, I seem to recall that you were here. It was uh, just, just over a year ago. Yeah. 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 The same time last year. So um, I think, I think both of you most of the time felt reasonably well didn't really have so much going on. You know, at the same time, you probably saw other people here who were, you know, terribly nauseous or were having bad headaches. Um, it just depends. It depends on the, the amount of toxicity in the body, the nature of that toxicity and where it's stored. It probably depends on the genetic inheritance, you know, our, our, our DNA. Um, there are all these different factors that are going to determine what, what someone experiences. But most people actually feel reasonably good, just a bit weak and tired most of the time. And then there may be periods where they feel worse than that, but it could be almost anything depending on what's going on with them. And are a lot of those symptoms related to um, us actually rehydrating a lot of old material and, and mucus? Uh, they are. Yeah. I mean, they're the, the symptoms, you know, it's, it's a funny thing because I'll often hear people say that fasting is painful or fasting is difficult. You know, that you feel bad when you fast and that is true sometimes but it's not because you're fasting. It's because you're detoxifying. Um, I, I still enjoy uh, active sports and activities when I, when I have time to, to engage in them. Um, as I think you know, uh, I, I still have a motorcycle and a quadricycle. Um, I ride mountain bikes, although not very often anymore. I used to rock climb quite a bit and ski and I still surf and body surf, and I will injure myself sometimes. I don't shy away from things that are dangerous if I enjoy them. Um, I mean, I don't want to die, but I, I know my, my body can heal itself. And so I have broken multiple bones over the years, uh, seven fingers, two toes, but two ribs, both knees, and my right hip. Um, and I'm here. <laughs> yeah, and um, every single time, I, you know, I have any kind of an accident or any kind of an injury that I need to heal, I will stop eating. I'll, I'll rest as completely as I'm able to, given the timing. I mean, if we have 30 people here that are, are here, 
for me to guide them through the process. I'm not going to not attend to them. I'm still going to see them, but I'm going to do as little as I'm able to do. And I'm going to not eat. I'm going to fast. And fasting for me is actually really easy because there are no symptoms. I feel perfectly fine. And that's because my body's not detoxing. I'm fasting not to detoxify, but to be able to put all the energy to healing a particular injury. You know, the more energy we can put towards healing, the faster we heal. And so just as a quick example, I had a construction accident many years ago. Um, I wound up uh, was standing on a kitchen stool and, and tipped it over. I was at the top of a concrete stairwell to a basement, my basement, in my house. And I wound up falling down the stairs and uh, my left wrist came down on a pile of metal molding that's as sharp as a razor, sliced through an artery and all my flexor tendons in my wrist and then bounced and came down again and sliced everything in a second place. So I, I cut clean through all my uh, one artery and all my flexor tendons twice and wound up in five hours of microsurgery, having it all reconnected, was told by the surgeon and the hand surgeon and a hand rehab guy that I might never have full use of my hand again, but I was definitely going to be in physical therapy for at least a year, given the, uh, you know, how extensive the injury and the damage was. Seven weeks and one day after the accident and surgery, the hand rehab guy said to me, I don't know how to explain this. I've never seen this before in 27 years of doing this work, but you don't need to come back. You're completely healed in seven weeks. They, they had said originally at least 52 weeks and maybe longer uh, and maybe not, never full, full use. You know, I completely regained full use of my hand. My hand works perfectly well. Um, no loss of strength, no loss of function, no loss of flexibility. And it happened in seven weeks. Of course, the very first thing I did was stop eating so my body could put all the energy to healing. And I've seen this over and over again. You know, it's amazing what happens over and over again.